flattened out into a um, vector. And here is a matrix vector multiplication plus bias. And then a whole bunch of them we're just going to set to zero. Right? So you can see here we've got a zero, 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 which corresponds to zero, 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 zero. So in other words, a convolution is just a matrix multiplication where two things happen. Some of the entries are set to zero all the time, and all of the ones of the same color always have the same weight. So when you've got multiple things with the same weight, that's called weight tying. Okay? So clearly, we could implement a convolution using matrix multiplication, but we don't because it's slow. Right? So in practice, our libraries have specific convolution functions that we use. And they're basically doing this, which is this, which is this equation, which is the same as this matrix multiplication. And as we discussed, we have to think about padding, because if you have a 3x3 three three kernel and a 3x3 three three image, then that can only create one pixel of output. There's only one place that this 3x3 three three can go. So if we want to create more than one pixel of output, we have to do something called padding, which is to put additional numbers all around the outside. So what most libraries do is that they just put a, a layer of zeros, not a layer, a, a, a bunch of zeros are, uh, are all around the outside. So for a 3x3 three three kernel, a single zero on every edge piece here. And so once you've padded it like that, you can now move your 3x3 three three kernel all the way across and give you the same output size that you started with. Okay? Now, as we mentioned in FastAI, um, we don't normally um, necessarily use zero padding. Um, where possible, we use reflection padding, uh, although for these simple convolutions, um, we often use zero padding because it doesn't matter too much in a big image. Um, it doesn't make too much difference. Um, Okay, so that's what a convolution is. So a convolutional neural network wouldn't be very interesting if it can only create top edges. So we have to take it a little bit further. So if we have an input, And it might be, you know, standard kind of red, green, blue picture, right? Um, then we can create a kernel, a three by three kernel, like so. And then we could pass that kernel over all of the different pixels. But if you think about it, we actually don't have a 2D input anymore. We have a 3D input, a rank 3 tensor. So we probably don't want to use the same kernel values for each of red and green and blue. Because, for example, if we're creating a green frog detector, we would want more activations on the green than we would on the blue. Right? Or if we're trying to find something that can actually find a gradient that goes from green to blue, then the different kernels for each channel need to have different values in. So therefore, we need to create a 3 by 3 by 3 kernel. Okay, so this is still our kernel. And we're still going to vary it across the height and the width. But rather than doing an element-wise multiplication of nine things, we're going to do an element-wise multiplication of 27 things, 3 by 3 by 3. And we're still going to then add them up into a single number. So as we pass this cube over this and the kind of like the little bit that's going to be sitting behind it, right, as we do that part of the convolution, it's still going to create just one number because we do an element-wise multiplication of all 27 and add them all together. So we can do that across um, the whole padded, single unit uh, padded input, 
And so we started with one, two, three, four, five by five. So we're going to end up with an output that's also five by five. Right? But now our input was three channels and our output is only one channel. Now we're not going to be able to do very much with just one channel because all we've done now is found a top edge. How are we going to find a side edge and a gradient and an area of constant white? Well, we're going to have to create another kernel. And we're going to have to do that convolved over the input, and that's going to create another 5x5. Five five. And then we can just stack those together across this as another axis, and we can do that lots and lots of times, and that's going to give us another rank 3 tensor output. So that's what happens in practice. Right? In practice, we start with an input which is h, sorry, which is h by w by, for images, 3. We pass it through a bunch of convolutional kernels, right? and we can get to pick how many we want, and it gives us back an output of, and it gives us back an output of height by width by however many kernels we had. And so often that might be something like 16 in the first layer. And so now we've got 16 channels, they're called. 16 channels representing things like how much left edge was on this pixel, how much top edge was in this pixel, how much blue to red gradient was on this, well, on this set of um, 27, well, 9 pixels each with RGB. And so then you can just do the same thing, right? You can have another bunch of kernels. And that's going to create another output, rank 3 tensor. Again, height by width by whatever, might still be 16. Now what we really like to do is as we get deeper in the network, we actually want to have more and more channels. We want to be able to find like a richer and richer set of features so that after a few, as we saw in the Zeiler and Fergus paper, by layer four or five, we've kind of got eyeball detectors and fur detectors and things, right? So you really need a lot of channels. So in order to avoid our memory going out of control, um, from time to time, we create a convolution where we don't step over every single set of three by three, but instead we skip over two at a time. So we would start with a 3x3 three three centered at 2,2, .2, and then we'd jump over to 2,4, 2,6, 2,8, and so forth. And that's called a stride 2 convolution. And so what that does is it's, it looks exactly the same, right? It's still just a bunch of kernels. but we're just jumping over two at a time, right? We're skipping every alternate uh, input pixel. And so the output from that will be h over two by w over two. And so when we do that, we generally create twice as many kernels. So we can now have, say, 32 activations in each of those spots. And so that's what modern convolutional neural networks kind of tend to look like, right? And so we can actually see that if we um, go into our pets and we grab our CNN, right? And uh, we're going to take a look at this particular cat. So if we go x comma y equals valid data set, some index, so let's just grab the zeroth. We'll go dot show and we'll print out the value of y. Apparently this cat is of category main coon. So until a week ago, I was not at all familiar that there's a cat called a main coon. Having spent all week with this particular cat, I am now deeply familiar with this main coon. Um, so we can, um, if we go um, learn.summary, um, remember that our input we asked for was um, 352 by 352 pixels. 
Um, generally speaking, the very first convolution tends to have a stride too. So after the first layer, it's 176 by 176. So this is learn.summary. We'll print out for you the output shape after every layer. 176 by 176. And the first set of convolutions is, has 64 activations. And we can actually see that if we type in learn dot model, you can see here it's a 2D conv with three input channels and 64 output channels at a stride of two. Okay. And interestingly, it actually starts with a kernel size of seven by seven. So like nearly all of the convolutions are three by three. See, they're all three by three. Right? Um, for reasons we'll talk about in part two, um, we often use a larger kernel for the very first one. Um, if you use a larger kernel, you have to use more padding, so we have to use kernel size int divide by two padding to make sure we don't lose anything. Anyway, so we now have 64 output channels, and since it was stride two, it's now 176 by 176. And then, as we go along, you'll see that from time to time, we have go from 88 by 88 to 40 by 40 by 44, the grid size. So that was a 2D conv, and then when we do that, we generally double the number of channels. So we keep going through a few more conv's, and they've, as you can see, they've got batch norm and ReLU. That's kind of pretty standard. And eventually, we do it again, another stride two conv which again doubles, okay, we've now got 5, 12 by 11 by 11. And that's basically where we finish the main part of the network. We end up with 5, 12 channels, 11 by 11. Okay, so we're actually at a point where we're gonna be able to do this heat map now. So let's try and work through it. Um, before we do, um, I wanna show you how you can do your own um, manual convolutions, because it's kind of fun. Um, so we're going to start with this picture of a main coon, and I've created a convolutional kernel. And so as you can see, this one has a right edge and a bottom edge with positive numbers, and just inside that it's got negative numbers. So I, I'm thinking this should show me uh, bottom right edges. Okay, um, so that's my tensor. Now, one complexity is that that 3x3 three three kernel cannot be used um, for this purpose, because I need two more dimensions. The first is I need the third dimension to say how to combine the uh, red, green, and blue. So what I do is I say um, dot .expand, this is my 3x3, three three, and I pop another 3 on the start. What dot .expand does is it says create a 3x3x3 three by three by three tensor by simply copying this one three times. I mean, honestly, it doesn't actually copy it. It pretends to have copied it, you know, but it, it, it just basically refers to the same block of memory. So it kind of copies it in a memory efficient way. So this one here is now three copies of that. And the reason for that is that I want to treat red and green and blue the same way for this little manual kernel I'm showing you. And then we need one more axis because rather than actually having a separate kernel, like I kind of printed these as if they were multiple kernels, what we actually do is we use a rank four tensor. And so the very first axis is for the, uh, every separate kernel that we have. So in this case, I'm just going to create one kernel. So to do a convolution, I still have to put this unit axis on the front. So you can see k dot shape is now 1, 3, 3, 3. So it's a 3 by 3 kernel. There are three of them. And then that's just the one kernel that I have. So it kind of takes a while to get the feel for these higher dimensional tensors, because we're not used to writing out a 4D tensor. But like, just Think of them like this. A 4D tensor is just a bunch of 3D tensors sitting on top of each other, okay? So this is our um, 4D tensor, and then you can just call conf2d 
passing in some image, and so the image I'm going to use is the first part of my validation data set and the kernel. There's one more trick, which is that in PyTorch, uh, pretty much everything is expecting to work on a mini batch, not on an individual thing. Okay, so in our case, we have to create a mini batch of size one. So our original image is three channels by 352 by 352, height by width. Right? So remember, PyTorch is channel by height by width. I want to create a mini, so I need to create a rank four tensor where the first axis is one. In other words, it's a mini batch of size one, because that's what PyTorch expects. So there's something you can do in both PyTorch and NumPy, which is you can index into an array or a tensor with a special value none, and that creates a new unit axis in that point. point. So T is my image of dimensions 3 by 352 by 352. T none is a rank 4 tensor, a mini batch of one image of 1 by 3 by 352 by 352. And so now I can go conf2d and get back my cat, specifically my main coon. Okay, so that's how you can play around with convolutions yourself. So how are we going to do this to create a heat map? This is where things get fun. Remember what I mentioned was that I basically have like my input, red, green, blue, and it goes through a bunch of convolutional layers. I'll just write a little line to say a convolutional layer to create activations which have more and more channels and eventually less and less, smaller and smaller height by width. Until eventually, remember we looked at the summary, we ended up with something which was 11 by 11 by 512. Right? There's, a whole, there's a whole bunch more layers that we skipped over. Now, there are... thirty-seven classes, because remember data.c is the number of classes we have, and we can see that at the end here we end up with 37 features in our model. So that means that we end up with a probability for every one of the 37 breeds of cat and dog. So it's a vector of length 37. That's our final output that we need, because that's what we're going to compare implicitly to our one hot encoded matrix, which will have a one in the location for main coon. Okay. So somehow we need to get from this 11 by 11 by 512 to this 37. And so the way we do it is we actually take the average of every one of these 11 by 11 faces. We just take the mean. So we're going to take the mean of this first face, take the mean, that gives us one value. And then we'll take the second of the 512 faces and take that mean, and that'll give us one more value. Right? So we're going to do that for every face, and that will give us a 512 long vector. Okay? And so now, all we need to do is pop that through a single matrix multiply of 512 by 37, And that's going to give us an output vector of length 37. Okay, so this step here where we take the average of each face is called average pooling. So let's go back to our model and take a look. Here it is. Here is our final 512, and here is, we, we'll talk about what a concat pooling is in part two. For now, we'll just focus on the, this is a fast AI specialty. Everybody else just does this. Average pool. Average pool do D with an output size of one. 
So here it is, output average pool 2D with an output size of 1. And then, again, there's a bit of a, um, a special fast AI thing that we actually have two layers here, but normally people then just have the one linear layer with the input of 512 and the output of 37. Okay, so what that means is that this little box over here where we want a one for main coon, we've got to have a box over here which needs to have a high value in that place so that the loss will be low. So if we're going to have a high value there, the only way to get it is with this matrix multiplication is that it's going to represent a simple weighted linear combination of all of the 512 values here. So if we're going to be able to say, I'm pretty confident this is a main coon, just by taking the weighted sum of a bunch of inputs, those inputs are going to have to represent features like how fluffy is it? What color is its nose? How long is its legs? How pointy are its ears? You know, all the kinds of things that can be used because for the other thing which figures out is this a bulldog, it's got to use exactly the same kind of 512 inputs with a different set of weights because that's all the matrix multiplication is, right? It's just a bunch of weighted sums, a different weighted sum for each output, okay? So therefore, we know that this, you know, potentially dozens or even hundreds of layers of convolutions must have eventually come up with an 11 by 11 face for each of these features saying, and this little bit here, how much is that part of the image like a pointy ear? How much is it fluffy? How much is it like a long leg? How much is it like a very red nose? Right? So that's what all of those things must represent. So each face is what we call, each of these represents a different feature. Right? So the outputs of these we can think of as different features. So what we really want to know then is not so much what's the average across the 11 by 11 to get this set of outputs, but what we really want to know is what's in each of these 11 by 11 spots. So what if instead of averaging across the 11 by 11, let's instead average across the 512. If we average across the 512, that's going to give us a single 11 by 11 matrix. And each item, each, each grid point in that 11 by 11 matrix will be the average of how activated was that area. When it came to figuring out that this was a main coon, how many signs of main coonishness was there in that part of the 11 by 11 grid. And so that's actually what we do to create our heat map. So I think maybe the easiest way is to kind of work backwards. Here's our heat map. And it comes from something called average activations. And it's just a little bit of matplotlib and fastAI. Fastai to show the image, and then matplotlib to take the heat map which we passed in, which was called average activations, HM for heat map. Alpha 0.6 means make it a bit transparent. And matplotlib extent means expand it from 11 by 11 to 352 by 352. Use bilinear interpolations that's not all blocky, and use a different color map to kind of highlight things. So that's just a matplotlib, it's not important. The key thing here is that average activations is the 11 by 11 matrix we wanted. Here it is, average activations dot shape is 11 by 11. So to get there, we took the mean of activations across dimension zero, which is what I just said. In um, PyTorch, the channel dimension is the first dimension. So the mean across dimension zero took us from something of size 512 by 11 by 11, as promised, to something of 11 by 11. So therefore, Activations, acts, contains the activations we're averaging. Where did they come from? They came from something called a hook. 
So a hook is um, a really cool, uh, more advanced PyTorch feature that lets you, as the name suggests, hook into the PyTorch machinery itself and run any arbitrary Python code you want to. Um, it's a really amazing and nifty thing. Because, you know, normally when we do a forward pass through a PyTorch module, it gives us this set of outputs. But we know that in the process, it's calculated these. So why would I, what I would like to do is I would like to hook into that forward pass and tell PyTorch, hey, when you calculate this, can you store it for me, please? Okay, so what is this? This is the output of the convolutional part of the model. So the convolutional part of the model, which is everything before the average pool, is basically all of that. Right? And so thinking back to transfer learning, right? remember with transfer learning, we actually cut off everything after the convolutional part of the model and replaced it with our own little bit. Right? So with FastAI, the original convolutional part of the model is always going to be the first thing in the model. And specifically, it's always going to be called, um, assuming, so in this case, I'm taking my model, and I'm just going to call it M, right? So you can see M is this big thing, but always, at least in FastAI, always M0 will be the convolutional part of the model. So in this case, we created a, let's go back and see, we created a ResNet 34. So the, the, the main part of the ResNet 34, the, the pre-trained bit we hold on to is in M0, and so this is basically it. This is the printout of the ResNet 34, and at the end of it, there is the 512 activations. So what, in other words, what we want to do is we want to grab M0, and we want to hook its output. So this is a really useful thing to be able to do. So FastAI has actually created something to do it for you, which is literally you say hook, output, and you pass in the PyTorch module that you want to hook the output of. And so most, of the, most likely the thing you want to hook is the convolutional part of the model, and that's always going to be M0, or learn.model0. So we give that hook a name. Uh, don't worry about this part, we'll learn about it next week. Uh, so having hooked the output, we now need to actually do the forward pass. Right? And so remember in PyTorch, to actually get it to calculate something, which is called doing the forward pass, you just act as if the model is a function. Right? So we just pass in our x, our x mini batch. So we already had a main coon image called x, right? but we can't quite pass that into our model. Um, it has to be normalized and turned into a mini batch and put onto the GPU. So FastAI has a thing called a data bunch, which we have in data, and you can always say data dot one item to create a mini batch with one thing in it. Okay? And as an exercise at home, you could try to create a mini batch without using data dot one item. So make sure that you kind of learn how to normalize and stuff yourself if you want to. But this is how you can create a mini batch with just one thing in it. And then I can pop that onto the GPU by saying dot CUDA. And that's what I pass to my model. And so the predictions I get out I actually don't care about, right? Because the predictions is the predictions is this thing, which is not what I want. Right? So I'm not actually going to do anything with the predictions. The thing I care about is the hook that I just created. Now, one thing to be aware of is that um, when you hook something in PyTorch, that means every single time you run that model, assuming you're hooking outputs, it's storing those outputs. And so you want to remove the hook when you've got what you want, because otherwise if you use the model again, it's going to keep hooking more and more outputs, which will be slow and memory intensive. So We've created this um, thing, uh, Py Python calls it a context manager. You can use any hook as a context manager. At the end of that with block, 
it'll remove the hook. Okay? So we've got our hook. And so now, PyTorch hooks, sorry, FastAI hooks uh, always give you something called, or at least the output hooks, always give you something called .stored, which is where it stores away the thing you asked it to hook. And so that's where the activation